Sean Sewell and Gearman.com podcast. We have back on our favorite guest. It's Pat Flynn. Oh, come on, your favorite? <laughs> Seriously, yeah. This five times now, maybe six times. Wow. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, always easy to talk with Pat. He's got the fitness background, the kettlebells, the virtuoso on guitar, the books. He has a new book. He has another book coming out soon. Yeah. A lot to talk about, Pat. So welcome back. It's great to be here, Sean. I always I always love chatting with you. Thanks for having me on. Absolute pleasure. All right. So um, for date and time, it is uh, the holidays. Hanukkah just wrapped up. Christmas for Pat and I will be here next week. Wow. It's crazy to think about. End of, end of the year, 2023. Mm-hmm. <laughs> time is flying. Oh, my gosh. Well, I guess let's try and catch up on your audience and my audience. What have you been up to, Pat, the last year? Yeah, I've had a lot of irons uh, in the fire in a lot of, you know, I like I like this whole idea of trying to to be a generalist. Right. So I always I always try to do a lot of different things and I always try to do them at least fairly well. Um, so this year was a big writing year for me, um, for your audience who isn't familiar with me or is only familiar with me in the in the fitness space. My more formal background is philosophy. So I've been doing a lot of work there and I wanted to essentially get uh, three things done. I wanted to get this this book written, which was just published in October. So that was a huge um, books kill me. I've written numerous books, but there's every time it just it it, it it you can I don't know if the lighting how the lighting is in here if you can see the progressive grayness of my of my beard or not. <laughs> um, and I wanted to get uh, two articles, two academic articles, written and published. And by the skin of my teeth, that is uh, that's right at the end of the year. Here, looks like that's going to happen. So uh, that's kept me very busy. I took on another new book project um, this year related to fitness. And I told you before we hit record that I literally have the edits due uh, today, uh, the sixteenth. Uh, which means if I get in at 11.59 p.m., I'll still have <laughs> made my deadline. So it'll be a long afternoon. Fortunately, yeah. it's not; they're not too brutal. I've already been, been chipping away at that. So a lot of a lot of writing, uh, uh, some some general business stuff. You know, um, just I'll, I'll tell you what though, like Sean, with um, with me, you know, things things always move where I'll, I'll kind of really focus and, and surge in, in some areas and just kind of keep other things in maintenance. You can't do everything at once at like the highest intensity. So you kind of have to pick and choose like, okay, I really want to focus on writing a book and like just not have my business explode. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? Let's just like, wait, let's just make sure you like that, that it keeps growing kind of at a normal pace or at least doesn't go down. So nothing like too crazy exciting on the, on the business front, but I also see kind of like everything else I'm doing, even if it's not immediately related, there's always, connections and and ways that it it helps just kind of what i'm doing uh business wise fitness wise same thing it's like pretty simple like this year i was really just focused on you know just trying to stay as healthy and generally fit as i can yeah. accumulated a lot of like aches and aches and pains over the years from just doing stupid stuff in the gym and i, I made a point to try and resolve those and i and I, I really have like i had really bad elbow tendonitis flare up last year oh. it's an awful injury because it's it's one of those there it's so annoying it's like it's, it's your elbow it's nothing yeah. Right. Who needs an elbow? Yet it affects everything you do, right? From opening the fridge to all the exercises. So I really worked hard to get that resolved and I did. Um and just playing a lot of music, man. And doing doing the band thing. We're gigging a lot. Uh so that's keeping me really busy because we have a preposterously large set list and it's mostly stuff I've never played before. So like I mean like hours a day it keeps me busy Whoa. for something that is of zero zero economic benefit whatsoever but just love get, to do it you know yep i get you on that i have two questions on it yeah okay the name of the band four on the floor mm-hmm. there's two ways to take this um my dj mind wants to take it as house music boom boom boom, boom. yeah mm-hmm. four on the floor you're like bass drum you know mm-hmm. yeah so the the bass note is on the fourth it's on a downbeat that's mm-hmm. typical house techno electronic yep. music in general but it's not yeah. you you, no, I it's... believe, are coming from the car angle. Yeah, That's good vision. guess. Yes. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, is I didn't know this until recently because it ain't my band. This band <laughs> has been around for about 20 years. Interesting story. The lead member of the band is Brad Schimmel. He's a former attorney general of our state, and he's running for Supreme Court in Wisconsin right now. He just announced it. So we were, we were on the news because we played his announcement rally and, and all this stuff. So now we're kind of – now I'm inadvertently sort of wrapped up with this whole – political campaign thing uh brad's an amazing dude he's an amazing dude but anyway the band has been around and in, in the milwaukee scene for like 20 years 
Whoa. And then uh, what happened is, you know, when COVID hit, uh, I guess things sort of fell apart with their other members and uh, their lead guitarist, uh, who was also their keyboardist, left to do his own thing. So they had these um, this slot open. I don't play keyboard, so they had to bring in multiple people to replace one guy type of deal. So so yeah. the band it, now it's it doesn't make sense because now we've got like six members, band of four on the floor. Uh, but no, it is it is what you said. It it is the car scene. These are I forget they had like some first gig was at like a gas station. Oh, there you go. It's yeah. something like it's something like that. I should know the story because it's it is Correct. my band now. But yeah. if somebody asks like, "Why are you called four on the floor?" I'd be like, "I don't know. It has something to do with cars." <laughs> the transmission thing. You yeah. Were... Listen to this song here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I think you had three on the tree or four on the floor. Is how the yeah. gearing worked. Maybe you yeah. can have six for fun. You know, six for fun. Yeah. So it's been fun. It's been it's been crazy, but it's been a lot of fun. Oh, I love seeing that. And I was just showing off your. uh virtuoso chops in our gym yesterday uh some woman came in and i was playing your uh, your eruption as your you know we're talking about on your video it looks amazing sounds amazing slight bit of clipping on, on the microphone which oh like, man it's those things but only you and i know that nobody yeah. else cares but i'm happy to help you fix it um so this yeah, i woman, appreciate that mm -hmm. yeah i got you covered uh this beautiful woman runs over what's going on I'm like have you ever heard of a virtuoso she's like oh yeah in the it world we consider it this and i was like what no Teach me that in five minutes. Right now, I'm going to show you a virtuoso. And so she's like, oh. <laughs> You're making me blush, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> well, you work your tail off for it, man. And it shows. Like, you have the noodling down and it's just – and then the slight use of the Floyd Rose, just – it's amazing. We actually had a band at our – we had a festivus last weekend for our gym, you know, in celebration of uh, airing of grievances and feats of strength that comes from Seinfeld. Yeah. And, and we have a very mi mixed uh, community we have. You know, people who celebrate Christmas and a lot who celebrate Hanukkah and a lot who just like to wear flannel and lift things up. And so yeah. we're like, dress like a lumberjack, bring your kids uh, and bring your favorite food and label I love it. food. It was so much fun, Pat. You would have loved it. About 80 oh. So I have a picture I'll probably shoot and put into the, the show notes. Everybody's in flannel. There's a bunch of jacked. I'm wearing it right now, brother. <laughs> <laughs> right there. I love it. Yeah, You'd fit right in. Just bring some turkey meatballs on a stick and you're in. Yeah. And, well. You know, it's 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 funny, and this might be of interest to your to your listeners who you talk about that um that eruption video I post. It's it's funny like how it will bring people out of because I just put it on Facebook. It's really just for my friends. I I don't have a guitar channel or anything like that. Not not really. And um, but if I did, I would like to. This is a project that will never happen anytime soon because I got so much else on my plate. Is I would love to do a guitar channel because there's a lot of stuff out there. That's like, oh, here's how to play eruption, and it's a tabs and this part. But it there's nothing so far as I can tell at least on YouTube, of how to practice eruption or how to practice Ooh, yeah. certain things. And that is that is a total, like, it's one thing to say, okay, those are the notes, right? Yeah. But how do I get it under my fingers, right? And um, there's so much for me, and for the gentle listeners, stay tuned, because this isn't going to stay on music. There's so much for me that I learned as an early musician of skill development that is applied across the board, right? Yeah. That is applied to, to business, to fitness, to martial arts, because like how you tackle something difficult with a musical instrument, uh, those that approach it, it, it generalizes. Uh, so I think it would, it would be cool if if you know to start like a skill building channel, but kind of angle in you know from 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 that perspective. Because again, there's a million people on YouTube who are teaching you these songs. But so far as I, I've been able to tell, and I've done a lot of research because I never. I think with Eddie Van Halen, I'm a huge Van Halen fan, but for all my guitar life, I never really played Van Halen. It was yeah. just that you really got me was on the set the Van Halen version. And the keyboardist is like, um, you know, we should do eruption. And I'm like, oh, heaven help me, right? Because like, this is like, the set list is already a nightmare for yeah. me. It's like, you know, we've got Van Halen, we've got Extreme, we've got ACDC. It's like, you guys have like three chords. I've got like 14 million notes, right? And five <laughs> kids. And, five kids. and I'm like, okay, I can do like something in the spirit of eruption, right? Like, yeah, I kind of know a few licks growing up, this or that. And then the keyboardist is like, no, man. The, the purists are going to get angry if you do that. I'm like, you're like, really? Like, really? Like, you're going to make me do this? So, like, the past year, man, I've, like, kind of obsessed over this thing um, where I'm like, I all right, I'm going to figure this, this damn thing. And, and honestly, like, I've played a lot of hard stuff. This is the hardest thing. I've, like, there's something about, you know what it is, Sean, for people who are music fans, I think they'll appreciate it. But if not, I think it's now the thing that makes Eddie so hard. This is an analogy I heard some some from somewhere else and i think it's i think it's absolutely right is that there's a lot of like 
stuff that I would play. It's like speed or progressive metal. It's very fast. It's very technical, but it's kind of predictable. It's mm -hmm. linear. There's a lot of patterns. So like once you kind of get the speed up, it's actually, it, it's, it's not as, it's not as hard as it sometimes looks. Right. Yeah. The thing with Eddie is somebody described it. It's like, it's like a uh, Matt Damon in the Bourne movies driving around in the mini Cooper. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just so chaotic. <laughs> it's all over the place. The, he ships gears crazily. The transitions you have to make, yeah. the leaps, the swing, the dynamics. And you're like, you're not sure if it's going to land. Like, you're nervous the entire time. Like, uh, is this going to explode at any minute, right? Yeah. Uh, that's that's what makes him so difficult, right? It's not that he plays absolutely faster than anybody. It's just that that spontaneous, chaotic, chaotic control that he has. That's, a really that's something I learned. Note. That's something I learned studying him. I'm like, this is like, because I was thinking like, I played faster stuff in this. Why is this so dang like hard, right? It's really, really hard. And it's something in that, in that neighborhood, if it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. That made sense to me that mm -hmm. I love Jason Bourne movies. And I'm just imagining him driving sideways down steps. I'm like, Eddie Van Halen would do this. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how's he going to stick this one? But then he <laughs> yeah. does, right? <laughs> yeah. That's a fantastic analogy. Oh, you're right. Uh, I enjoy playing very fast, very aggressive metal, um, mm -hmm. but I can't touch 90% of what he does it's just over my pay grade right now. But practice, you're really good about practicing. And back to uh, finding a way to help people with that. Um, years ago, I created the Mountain Fitness School. And I went through a, a service called Teachable, which has the uh, alternative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Teachable was able to load up videos and have progressions like, okay, you can do the deadlift. Now let's try the start stop swing let's now let's try the two-handed swing then now we can progress up so maybe we can do like a run and then okay i can do a run hammer on and hammer offs so and now you can do a run through this you know kind of thing might be an idea of how to build people up some confidence and give them the skills to approach to do some really fun music yeah no so I, well yeah let's i mean let's we can just take it from the music thing the one and i talk about this in my my 2019 book how to be better at almost everything this is the 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 method i use it's i call it the three eyes approach right mm -hmm. and the uh, the three eyes are um isolation integration and improvisation and so the idea there and this is something i really learned first in music right this was just this was just taught to me and then i, I realized later on like oh wow you can apply this to almost everything so the idea is okay you're learning a skill you're, you're tackling something we, we can start with music but then we can show how it works to writing or um, fitness or, or whatever. Um, and you identify this, the, the initial speed humps, whatever those are, right? This is something my instructor always taught me, like, you got to practice the speed humps. Don't worry about doing the whole thing every time. Cause like you're, you're good at this section. You, you, you break down here. You need to focus, isolate. So you, you isolate and look, starting out, you might have to kind of isolate everything, right? But you isolate the things that are really struggling. You take them out of their immediate context and, you know, you just rehearse them until they become second nature, whatever it is. Maybe it's it's any, you know, couple uh, seconds worth of eruption that's giving you trouble. You just pull it out. You put the metronome on, which, by the way, that doesn't fit to eruption, but you just do it anyways. Right. <laughs> and you just boom, 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 until you can do it without thinking about it. Right. But then that isn't enough, because if you just do that, you realize it breaks down when you put it back into context. And that's where it's integration. You got to make sure that it's it's fitting back into the wider project that that you need it to fit into, right? It's one thing to just get like one passage under your fingers, but how do you get in? How do you get out? And so what you do then is you start to kind of widen it out. Okay, I need to make sure that I'm practicing the first couple notes going into it and the first couple notes getting out of it. That's really important, right? Transitions and everything and exercise in, in writing, how you transition in your writing or how you transition in, in your music are huge people often where people mess up a lot are in the transitions right i mean think of the kettlebell swing when do people usually round their back when they're putting it down right yeah <laughs> or when they're starting it's the tr it's the starting and the stopping the getting in getting out where people are just for whatever reason prone to making those sorts of mistakes so then you have to focus on the integration how do i get it to fit back in you know seamlessly and for something like anything eddie's doing it's always insane because he's always just kind of switching techniques and you got to dump from like one kind of crazy swing lick to a a, a whammy bar thing and then a tremolo picking thing. And it's stupid. It's stupid. It's absolutely stupid. <laughs> uh, but you have to get those things to, to fit together. Same thing if you're transitioning between starting or stopping exercises or complexes or flows or, or circuits or, or what have you, right? It's really important to practice those transitions and then to integrate. And eventually, you know, you build the full, the full integration. The idea is, okay, whatever I've been isolating for however long I need, 
I need that to be integrated into a full song that I have complete control over an entire workout or program or whatever. And then the the highest level this doesn't always apply to everything, but I think it's it's kind of worth reaching towards is that improvisational aspect where you have something so so well under command or control that you can sort of breathe your own life into it, mm -hmm. that you can start to be more intuitive with it. So in, in music, that means you just start to improvise. You start to be a little bit creative. And it's really important for me because a lot of people are creative with things in music, but the creative, they improvise before they were able to integrate. Okay, you're improvising because you couldn't do the thing originally, right? Yep. And that's... <laughs> And like, hey, fair enough. For some things, like, that's whatever, right? But for me, if we're talking about true mastery, mm -hmm. you have to own the thing first, and then you make it your own, right? Then you start to improvise with it. Same thing with with exercise. It's really important for me. I tell my clients, look, we're going to do things by the book. You're going to own the program. You're going to you're gonna follow the protocol. And then over time, things will sink into you, and you'll, you'll learn to be more intuitive. And this is, again, yeah. something my music theory teacher always taught me. She, she was, she was amazing. This was in high school, always hammered it in my head. You have to know the rules before you break the rules or bend, or at least bend them, right? You have to know the rules before you bend or break the rules. Cause I always wanted to break the rules. I'm like, my rock guys, you know, they do parallel fists all the time. It's like, we don't do that in classical music, right? Here's why. But, and then you learn why. And then of course, as a rock guitarist, you're going to go just break all the rules, right? <laughs> um, so same thing with exercise. People want to be intuitive in their approach. I get it. There's something free about being intuitive, but if you don't have the chops and the command and the control and the knowledge of the basic principles and application, you're not going to be successfully intuitive. You're just going to wander in circles. So it's sort of intuitive programming would be kind of my parallel to improvisation for exercise that once you have such a command of it, like you can kind of auto or self-program, mm -hmm. you know, if, if that, does that make sense? Completely. Those things yeah, and, and yeah. on both levels too. Uh, mm -hmm. I would get to work with people for coaching and they'll come in. I know the swing. I'm like, cool, show me your swing. They don't have the swing. We're going to do something else for a while. Why, coach? Trust me. You want to get to here so that feels good. So that if you want, are having the intuition, you want to do an additional set, green light. And that's so like, it's so important to impress that upon people. And it's, it's kind of annoying because nobody wants to hear like, oh, you kind of got to do the thing that sucks and you don't want to do to get the thing that's cool and that you do want to do, but it's true, mm -hmm. right? Like you can't play a really cool piece of music unless you sit there with the stupid metronome on <laughs> and just do your extra. And it's boring. It's it super boring. boring, right? Um, Same thing with exercising and programming. Yeah. You just got to hammer that technique. You got to do a lot of that tedious grinding work. Same thing with writing. You have to yes. just read a ton. You have to just get a certain word count sort of every day. It's tedious, but that's, um, you know, there's a saying discipline equals freedom, right? When you discipline mm -hmm. yourself like that, you then gain the skill to be free and creative in a, a, in a way that's extremely exciting. And then you look back like, oh, that was, that, that was worth it. Right. So that's, that's all you can really say to people. Like at some point you're going to look back and you're going to realize this was worth it. And you're glad you did it. Probably won't like it now. Maybe you won't hate it. I hope, I hope you try not to hate it. Right. And yeah. I hope you try to see like where we're going. But people like, yeah, it's so important to understand that that is just a necessary part of the process. Oh, I love it. And that last part from Jocko Willicks, who's a terrifying voice, but good wisdom. It's but, traditional. Um, it's traditional wisdom that people have yeah. forgotten. You know, it's stoic wisdom. It's it's um, it's Christian wisdom. Right. The idea has always been that like true freedom for a human being is flourishing. It's not being bound down by by various uh, restrictions or restraints or addictions or, or sins or whatever. And that, that, yeah. And that you make the good life at first accessible by disciplining yourself and then effortless that, that discipline equals freedom. It's a very traditional notion of freedom. And, and Jocko just sort of tapped into that and helped reintroduce modern culture to ancient wisdom in many respects. Well, yeah. Thank you for uh, turning us on to that. I don't want, I don't want to be, be, be uh, starting with him and ending with him. Uh, so that's more fascinating and more respectful than anything. So thank you for that. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of your book, looks like uh, How to Be Better at Almost Everything is now an audible book. This is new to me. Yeah, I think that's that's been around for a while because I I voiced it. They, um, I was surprised. I'm like, who wants to hear my annoying voice? I can't stand it on my own podcast. But they, <laughs> they were pretty insistent. They're like, no, people like when the author does it. And that was crazy because they flew me out to a studio in Michigan and uh, I did, and they gave, they booked me for three days, but like, I just, man, I don't like traveling, Sean. I didn't want to be there. So I did the entire thing in a single day, just sat in that studio room for just all day long. I'm like, I am finishing uh, this book. And um, people ask, well, how did your voice hold up? My voice wasn't the problem. I'm, a, I'm, I'm jabber jaw. I talk all the time. The thing <laughs> that hurt the most were my eyes. 
because oh, I had to really? look and read the iPad. The, like my eyes just felt like they were going to fall out of my my head like yeah. halfway through and I'm like, I'm just going to keep going. So anyways, we got it done. So I, yeah, that's been there for a while. I haven't listened to it. Um, I'll listen to it tomorrow. I um, I had a fun thing with Audible. They canceled our account and I had to reactivate it and I proved my member. They gave me 15 credits. So I'm, I'm good on credits and it'd be the first book I get. But let me know, man, because like I've, I'm nervous. I like, like some, some stuff I have to go back because talk about self-improvement. One of the most important aspects of self-improvement is review. You need a review process. If it's music, you need to record yeah. yourself. You need to listen back. If it's writing, you need to edit yourself, right? Yes. Like good writing is, is editing. If it's exercise, you need to track your workouts, see how you're doing. You need to film your technique. Like review, review. is the quickest way to get better at something, right? But there are some things I don't, care about enough and i know if i just like listen to myself recording that stupid book i'll probably be like just annoyed and it's not like i get a do-over at it right yeah. <laughs> so i just haven't because i haven't listened to it so i hope you don't hate it yeah no i'm, I'm sure it's me fantastic and mm -hmm. uh, i definitely will purchase the be best argument for god as well oh cool but um about the review process my selfish thing to do is if it, I've had a few drinks, I'm camping and I have service, I'll go onto our YouTube channel and I'll just watch some videos from two or three years ago. And I'm like, who is that jackass? The audio <laughs> is horrible. The white balance is all off kilter. The framing's horrible. The information's good. I could have done this better. I could have done that better. Yeah. And it's true. All the things I could do better. So then I go home and I figure out how to do them better and evolve and, you know, hopefully offer a better service for people out there. Well, that's it, man. And yeah, I mean, you're you're a pro. Everything looks and sounds amazing with the way you do it. So, it, I mean, it really Thank shows. But review is painful. Like, if we're being honest, it like is. you don't want you don't want you don't want to look at yourself. Like, who annoys oh. you in life more than yourself, right? I mean, <laughs> especially doing something bad. I imagine that there's like two exceptions to that. Uh, Morgan Freeman's probably like, there's no way he listens back to himself and is like anything but very pleased, right? Yeah, he, uh, uh, but but David Attenborough probably doesn't. Yeah. Um. Who's who's the guy? Um. British guy. Um, what movie was he in? He was in the one of the latest Fast and the Furious movies. Just has the most. Jason Statham. No, nah, well, he's definitely one of them. There's no way that he listens back to himself and it's no, like he has people know. listen for him. Yeah. Oh, Idris Elba. Oh, Idris Elba. Yeah, super handsome. Yeah. Great voice. Yeah. But there's a reason that these people are actors and voice. But for the rest of us, nobody wants to. Nobody wants <laughs> to plebeians. Review. It's painful. Your voice, your writing, your music, your fitness, anything. Review is painful. Why? Because when you take that perspective on yourself, you just notice the negatives, right? You really yeah. do. We have we have an inherent negativity bias. This is just something that's wired into us, and that's a painful thing. But I'll tell you what: it's if if there's anything that is legitimately a shortcut to getting better. It is review because you will just immediately be so focused on why am I saying um every other sentence or write every other sentence? Like why am I making those faces when I'm playing yeah. guitar or when I'm swinging a kettlebell, right? Or why is my why did back look like Quasimodo when I'm squat? Like it just and it oh, yeah. sticks in your brain. But I'll tell you what, because it's because it annoys you that you will then go and fix it quickly. 100%. Whereas if you don't do that, you'll be unaware of it and you know you'll waste I don't know, years maybe just ingraining these bad habits. So as painful as review is, if there's one thing I could offer to anybody, it's just have a process of self-review for anything you want to get better at, whatever it is. It's absolutely indispensable. Amen to that. That is fact. Yeah, I'll, I'll sometimes see pictures of myself and I'm like, who's that jackass with bad <laughs> posture and like no hair back here? I'm like, oh, that's me. You look great, man. I love the uh, touch of gray. It's, oh, thanks. Uh, it's I'm, I'm earning yeah, it. For sure. Yeah, I'm what getting is, there. I'm getting there. My yeah. wife was pointing out some of my gray hairs, and she's a fan of gray, so I'm not like shy about it. I'm kind of hoping it you know, progresses. Yeah you, yeah, you earn it for sure. I was taking yeah. my brother-in-law for his 40th birthday last night, and he's got a lot of gray. He also has four daughters. Well, you you have five kids. You understand? Yep. And um, yeah, but I feel like it just came in all of a sudden gray. I'm I'm hoping it stays like this for a while because it's kind of a fun look. And I turned 45 uh, day after Christmas, so I'm gonna stay. Oh. Yeah, nice, dude. You could be on a product box for sure. There you go. Just for men. 45-year-old right? version. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something cheesy like that. Yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate the compliment. I, uh, I was with Brett Jones, actually, at the, at the most recent Strong First event, and uh, some other colleagues around your age, my age. And we somebody took a picture, and we're looking at it, and we're like, who are those people? So we almost all of us have a bald spot right here, and almost all of us have a bit of a slouching now. You know, almost yeah. have a little bit of a, a 
beer belly, even though I don't drink beer. Yeah. And we're all like, man, is this this midlife? Well, at least we're strong and fun and happy. Dude, I mean, that's that's it, man. I uh, again, I was talking to my wife about this, like getting older, you know, it's it's got its, you know, little things here and there. But I like it, dude. You know, yeah. like you just like I don't I don't want to be 22 again. Not not for a second, not for a second, man. Like I never look back and like, oh, I wish I was still twenty two or twenty five. I'm like, I'm not that old, but it's still, it's just, yeah, you know, like okay, I need to up my mobility routines, need to do more T spine rotations. I yeah, do, um, sure. but okay, fair enough, you know. Yeah. Doing onward, pretty good. Onward, oh. optimistic, yeah, for sure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you just also just don't care. Like it's so funny. Like you don't care about so many vain things as you get older. Mm -mm. At least, at least. I don't think so. Um, I remember, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine and he was 10 years older than me when I was in college and uh, he was like ripped to the gills. And then like, you know, a couple of years, you know, later, uh, he's still very strong and fit, but didn't really like care about being super ripped anymore. And, and he just like explained to me, he's like, oh yeah, I just don't really, just don't really care about that anymore. Yeah. And, like I didn't get it at the time. Cause like, you know, you're like early twenties. That's all you want to be is like super ripped. Now I get it. Like this is a lot more important things totally. in life. Than those just vain, superficial, you know, treasures that you're seeking as a as a young foolish kid, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of it might have to do with uh, mindset. I know mine was probably a little bit of body dysmorphia, so I'm chasing that eight pack at all times. And oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then you mentioned your elbow. I ripped my funny bone actually out. Oh, I see. Is that a scar from it? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, dude. That's a nice battle wound. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I've got quite a few of those. I had two surgeries this year. Um, I've been putting them off for almost 20 years, and I find them back to back, and uh, they're going good, going good. Good. I'm glad yeah. to hear it. Well, basically, I had arthritis in both my big toe joints, so they would not move, and so to move, I had to distract the toe and then and then move it every morning just to get my shoes. Wow, on. yeah, <laughs> that's, wild, yeah. that's a neat that's a neat trick you could yeah, I, show people. Yeah, I, first thing in the morning, <laughs> brush teeth, break toes. Kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> after 19 years of doing that, I actually broke my foot. Like broke broke my foot uh, in March, kicking my wooden table. No reason, no good reason. Yeah. Uh, I was in the middle of the night, got up, wanted to go pee, kicked it full force, broke the toe in half or broke the foot in half. And then when we were there, we we're at the hospital. Like, okay, your foot is broken, but also your toes are broken, way worse. And they yeah. have years, so you need this surgery. And that's like the eighth time I've been told I need to do the surgery. So I met a really cool doctor, surgeon, who's also a backcountry skier, knew who I mm -hmm. was, is part of our backcountry ski group. And I was like, okay, you get who I am. You get what I want to go do. I will do whatever you tell me to do. I'll do PT daily. I will yep. teach them how to use the kettlebells when I'm done with our session. So I did. Did the surgery, do all the PT. And now all the PT, they're smart people. They're doctors. They're all members of our gym. Learning That's how amazing. To swings and we're, you know, they taught me something, teach them something. And it's fun. That's amazing. I'm, I'm so happy for you. And um, yeah, I feel the same way. Like whenever... You know, very grateful for medical professionals, but I always try to find, you know, somebody who's like on the same page. Generally. It helps. You, you get what I do. You get what I want to do. Yeah. And like, we're on the same, we're on the same team here. Right. Yeah. hundred mm -hmm. percent. Like, cause he's actually, my last meeting was on Thursday. He's like, I'm not going to see you in my office again because you're recovering quicker than usual. You're going to be fine. But I do hope to see you, uh, these backcountry trailheads. I have your cell phone number. You have mine. Uh, nobody else gets to text me. Please text me when what days you're going to go up there because I want to pick your brain in a zone. So yeah, that's awesome, man. That's, <laughs> that's, that's great. Right. <laughs> yeah, making friends. Yeah, uh, good stuff. But yeah, um, getting older, things just hurt. That's how it goes. But and then also that back to that picture where you know I was kind of feeling bad about myself and the mm -hmm. gray hair and Brett Jones was like, you even have hair, you know, giving me a hard time. But then look at that picture. Who's in that room with us? The Pavel. And there's Brett Jones and Sven Rager and uh, our friend Jeff Newport. Like these are our pretty heroes. sweet, like, so pretty like, sweet. Reframe, mm -hmm. <laughs> just get to be in the room with these people and work with them. Yeah, so, yeah. It's amazing how quickly you can take stuff like that for granted. So Jeff was there. That's great. I oh, he was. Seen Jeff, yeah, we shared a brief message back and forth the other day on online. But that's that's very cool. I wish I was there, man. That's why weren't like you a there? Time. You yeah, I don't. Time. So yeah. my my role there was I, I worked directly with Fabio. Uh, Zonin, the CEO of Strongfords, and Pavel, and then Brett Jones. Then I mic them up with the microphones we have around here, you know, like the little ones right here. Boop. Yep. And then, um, but it's a, you know, 10 hour, 12 hour course. So these die out at about five hours. So the the crazy part is I have like 10 sets of microphones. So I'm always trying to watch the battery <laughs> life. I'm like, okay, as Pavel turns his back, we're going to swap that one out onto him. Oh. 
Brad yeah, Jones yeah. is going to go. Can you can you get Fabio? So that's the neurosis behind it. Then have a hey man, but that makes for an efficient efficient product for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, like it's they record it on the spot, and you got all these masters giving incredible wisdom, and a lot of a lot of learning opportunities going on. You have all your colleagues, and you got Jeff there. You got people that you you know a lot of people there. Everybody's hanging out, notebooks, taking notes frantically, just drinking from a fire hose. You know, uh, it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. What was this event? Uh, this event was um well. I guess Paul has a new book, X. Oh yeah, okay. So it was it was based around that. Yeah, my buddy Jim Madden, who I podcast with frequently on my philosophy channel, he's doing that program right now, and there he's you. loving it. He's absolutely loving. It. He actually wants to come on my fitness show and, and discuss it. So we'll probably be doing an episode oh, on that somewhat I, soon. I can yeah. speak to that too. I'm, I'm doing it as well. Yeah. I was just finishing up uh, Doc Cardle's book, which is up there as well. Mm -hmm. And um, Doc Cardle is the leader for the barbell certifications for a strong first, real yeah. strong guy. Um, Jim, yeah, your friend Jim probably has some insights into this. Basically, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's real basic hand-to-hand -hand swings. Yep. Four mm -hmm. reps on the minute. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, he's loving it. Quick story about him. If people don't know my my buddy Jim, it's it's a funny story because we got connected in the philosophy world. He's he's um he focuses on like philosophy of mind. I was doing some research, so I just got connected with him and and we started just becoming friends, having lots of conversation. And then I found out he's into the kettlebell thing too. And not only that, he was into it even before I was. He's like an OG man. He was like early two thousands, and he he's one of those guys. He uh, he played football in, in college, and then kind of you know uh, just pursued you know the, the life of 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 academia and gained a whole bunch of weight. And then Pavel and Pavel's programs helped him lose a hundred pounds. And he's since gone on to you know win worlds in jujitsu. Uh, master's oh. division and just just he's killing it now and he's still to this day just you know, work in the pavel programs and just yeah being hench and, and totally badass yeah that's incredible hats off to him from me mm -hmm. has he written a paper about it for strong first or is he, has, he has a book out but it's not a strong first book it's uh oh man jim i'm gonna let you down by by messing up the title it's does tactical barbell no that's a pavel thing right um if you give me two and a half seconds, Jim Madden fitness book, it is, oh, come on, Jim. What is it? Ageless Athlete. He's got an Ageless Athlete book out. Um, hmm. Ageless Athlete. It's done well. It's done. I know it's done well. And um, yeah, Tactical Barbell presents Ageless Athlete by Jim Madden, PhD. Yeah, so even though he is... A professional philosopher, um, he has publications in fitness, and uh, he's just he's just a brilliant guy. It's because he's such a professional philosopher; he can just think so well about things. So, I would highly recommend that people check out some of his his fitness content. It's just really well done. Mm -hmm. Doctor Jim Med, excellent. All right, yeah, just it's just one of those funny small world types of things. We got connected <laughs> in in one way, and then it's like we have this whole other world totally in common, but somehow our paths just never crossed. It's because he used to be on like the RKC forums all the time, and where all of us used to hang out and stuff. But I guess just whatever, just never, just never ran into each other. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Good for him. Ah, well, hopefully cross paths sometime in the future with him as well. Yeah, we'll have to get out to one of your guys' events at some point. We we have a couple coming up. We have the Strong First uh, Body Weight with Karen Smith. Oh yeah, May, and then we booked Talk about Flexibility, Flexible Steel. We have that in July with Engum. Is he still doing that? He is, but my my buddy Matthew Flaherty is going to lead this one. Okay, yeah, I have not. I have just haven't kept up with uh, with all that stuff. But that would be amazing. That would be awesome. Karen the cake. My wife and I are building the house right by the airport. Gets done in March. Uh, we're building it with a studio in the basement, of course, with guitar amps. And we have a full-on guest bedroom. We'd love to have you if you need a place to stay. For Don't tempt me too much, man. I might be knocking <laughs> on your door very soon. Uh, you'll be welcome yeah, to any time. Yeah. Um, what else have you been up to, man? What have you been working on? You've been asking me a bunch of questions. I'm curious <laughs> to hear what, what your projects have been. Well, uh, you know, getting to work with Pavel a few times a year now has been really cool. I remember the last time we talked, I, I was like, what do I do? How do I approach this? And basically... Like you said, just just show up, be prepared, practice as much things as possible because things will always break, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, then, any any way something can go wrong, it will, right? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And when it does, do not freak out. Mm -hmm. Calm is contagious. Play it cool. 
Yes, play, play it cool. cool. <laughs> Nobody yeah. knows the internet went out. We lost four minutes of the Zoom for the whole world. Just play yeah. it cool. Bang. Dude, again, that's something that I I learned early on. As like every gig, every gig we play a lot of gigs. Every gig, yeah. something goes wrong. <laughs> something like the keyboards, like can't get on the internet, and get us patches or something, which mm -hmm. are you know really important for us all, or uh, something. Something goes wrong. Somebody forgot a cable that we need or something. Right? Power yeah. cable comes out of the wall. Learn yeah, it's that X. Or we just don't have enough electricity, you know. Just oh to yeah. Power our enormously obnoxious band, right? Mm -hmm. I was working with Derek Toshner. You know Derek. Oh yeah, I just chatted with him recently. Mm -hmm. He's the man. We had him out here for a seminar, all train conditioning course, and then I got to have dinner with him and his brother Ryan um, after that event. Actually, here's the menu from that event. Dude. Yeah, the strong first menu. I love it. Look steak. Better be steak on there. Yep. Yeah, I gotta have steak. Um, yeah, Ryan. Ryan is right down the street from me. I haven't okay. seen him in a while, but I used to. Yeah, I need to go pay him a visit on a TNT. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's fun. He's fun. Uh, so Derek. Became a, a writer with Engearment, our gear review media company. Uh, he was doing a big hike up to Denali and wanted to see if we can get him some gear. So we got him outfitted, head to toe, thermal rest, outdoor research, uh, GoPro, some, some other stuff. And he went up to Denali, used it, did reviews in the backyard of his place. It, up there dude, stuff. I need to give you guys a plug because that's he came on my podcast not recently and just re, and just told that entire crazy story. Of what? Of yeah, so uh, we'll have to. I'll get you a link if you want. If people want to hear I it, but I, I yeah. yeah, I just I spoke with him in the back half of the episode. It was just him just telling us all about that, right? And it was wild, absolutely wild. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's so fun because I see how you and I interact, or how how uh, Derek and I interact. I don't know how it goes outside of that. So I, I would love to see that. It's honestly, Pat. It's my favorite thing is watching the writers um, get the gear in, go use it in the activities. And then what I what I try and do is I try and build up their brand, their portfolio. I'm like, okay, I asked for this sleeping bag for you this time. Here's the contact. So next mission, like some of my guys are going down to the third highest mountain in Mexico. It's actually a volcano, a strata volcano. Mm. And I was like, guys, you know how to write an email? Just run past me with the first time. The rest of the time, I trust you. Just go do it. And they went and pitched their own companies. And they most of them they landed. So now they have uh, some lower extreme hiking boots, some Jobo glacier glasses and uh thermal rest sleeping bags thing of 20 degree sleeping bags like they got all the stuff yeah and all it is is them having the confidence to reach out to the company us having the the relationship with them already to trust mm -hmm. us and doing for 10 years and then give them a gopro or their, or their cell phone and go shoot the footage everybody's happy the companies are happy the stuff's getting used by cool people i'm happy to see my friends go do the thing and then um the PR companies are like, look, we got this in the hands of people who are using it, not just journalists hanging out in the middle of New York City. You know, right. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's a great. That's a great point. And there's another good general point there. It's like, man, if people would just learn to ask more, you might get a lot ask. more. It may say no. People, people, okay yeah, you them. might say no, but like, man, if, if there's one other lesson that I've learned through these many years of trying different things. It's just like if you just gotta keep asking, right? Like, success is. It's it's not entirely a numbers game, but it's predominantly a numbers game, mm -hmm. right? It's just like, look, if you only step up the bat once, what's your chances not yeah. high, of ever hitting a home run? Not high, right? But if you're constantly getting up there swinging, yes, you're going to have a lot of misses, no mm -hmm. doubt. As you get as you get better and you review and you refine, you'll have fewer and fewer misses, and you'll have a lot of singles, maybe some doubles. You'll get out a bunch, but yeah, every once in a while you might hit that home run or even grand slam, but you just have to keep getting after it keep keep asking i mean um you know the first the first book deal i got was with with wiley which is you know a good publisher and i got it very young but the only but i was just like I, I wasn't incredibly smart i don't think i had a good hook but i was just i was just damn stubborn and persistent right <laughs> just like and i could just i i've always been pretty good at just taking it on the chin and taking the rejections and be like oh okay all right fine you're lost loser next one right <laughs> And yeah, it's just if if you just yeah, I would encourage people just to ask more and just and just yeah. and just play the numbers game for anything that you that you just you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. it's such good advice, and I hope people get it. It's gonna be hard advice to take at first. And another thing to talk about something we're doing this year. Every year we do um, a, what's called a Beacon Bash. Mm -hmm. This is our sixth annual Beacon Bash. And how it started was three friends, myself and two friends, wanted to go to a parking lot with snow and practice our beacon skills. A beacon is just basically a little, little radio to communicate. Mm -hmm. And everybody has one on their person, and you usually have it in uh, send mode, so a signal is going out. 
person goes missing, we're like, whoa, where'd Pat go? Well, then we take it off and we put it in a search mode and we hopefully use the beacon to locate Pat. Yeah. And uh, it takes skill. There's education courses. There's certifications for it, of course. And um, we put it online in our little Facebook group. Like you have a, a nice big Facebook group as well. And the response was like, oh, yeah, I want to come there. And next thing you know, we had 120 people in just parking lot full of snow. And we got shut down. The, the county people come by like, do you have a permit? I'm like, no. Uh, what do we do? And he was super cool. I was like, well, let me call Winter Park. And Winter Park is, is a ski resort here in Colorado. And it's not terribly far away from where we were. He calls them up and they're like, oh, yeah, we're not open yet. They can have the parking lot. And as, as long as they use the restrooms and not go to restroom outside the restrooms, we're good. And so uh, they give us a parking lot and then the search and rescue team shows up and then the dog rescue team shows up and then uh, Beacon Park people show up and the, uh, it turned into an event, right? And every year it keeps getting bigger and bigger. This year we started as a 501c3 nonprofit mm-hmm. because every year I'm spending like $2,000 to try oh, yeah. to raise $2,000 for the nonprofits. Right. Like, that's not making any sense. Hmm. So, yeah. Hmm. Business, <laughs> the bread every time. Yeah, it's funny how easy it is not to care about that stuff, though. Right, until like, until you look at your bank account, it's like, all right, I need to start caring about this stuff, right? Yeah. Is this why I cannot buy a house? Is because I throw in a nonprofit. Yeah. Uh, but mm-hmm. the nonprofit, we paid ourselves back, and so we're able to still uh, have structure moving forward, and then franchise at different states have different. Uh, oh, very cool. Yeah, so we have one in uh, New Mexico, one in Washington, one in Utah. And they're all to benefit the local avalanche information centers and the local search and rescue teams. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Where I'm going with this is we formed a team. So it wasn't just me making the pitches. I'm like, hey, it's the Sean from Engagement. Can I get split boards for the raffle? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Of course. And But it became you know five or six of us like, hey, uh, Smith sunglasses, could we get some goggles for this thing? They're like, heck no. Like, mm-hmm. And then we just get so disenfranchised. I'm like, guys, that was one ask out of a list of 20 <laughs> right right get to yeah. it. <laughs> just get to it. it's not personal just do it yeah dude that's it and you know this is something i learned um actually is a fun, funny thing i've never really had a real job in in my life because i always figured i'd do something with music or, or writing or something like that and and even though i do a lot of music it's really writing that is, and tied into marketing my own business that i do but the kind of real job i had for a little bit when i was in uh, late high school and college was selling cars uh, so my stepmom worked at a car dealership, and she helped me get my uh, license. You needed a license in Wisconsin to do it, but you could get it when like, you were six, six, like young. Wow. Um, and boy, man, like you learn, like you're either not going to make any money because, like the, the the way the business was, at least when I was there, it was like if you didn't sell cars, you didn't get paid, right? Yeah. And uh, I needed money. I needed money for college, really bad. So like that just taught me like quick, like you pick up the phone. And you just and like that's not a fun thing. Like <laughs> trying to just cold call somebody and sell them a car. You got like you kidding me, right? Yeah. Like like of course it's going to be an overwhelming number of rejections. Then they see, you know, on the phone, and they come in and they see you're like some you know eighteen year old kid, right? <laughs> it's like what sort of like authority or credibility do you have, right? So that was uh, that was a really like looking back. That was a really important uh, learning experience for me again about the like not just the numbers game. Like, look, I've got all these numbers, and like, yes, there's going to be enormous rejections. But look, if I just get a few of them, like, that's pretty good, right? Yeah. And that's all I got to do. And like, of course, as I'm getting rejected, I'm trying to like, okay, what did I say wrong? How should I have approached that better? And sometimes there's there's nothing you can do. Like this person just wasn't going to buy a car th- that. But there's other times when it's like, no, I could, I really could have closed that deal, right? Mm-hmm. But I blew it because of X, Y was whatever it was, right? So you, you you refine as you go. So that'd be my other advice to people: go go work in a car dealership for about six months, and like you will never be shy about rejection ever again, right? Nope. Yeah, just go just go get it out of your system, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. That's really good advice the the board of people we have or the, the chair people of the board one of them is an insurance salesman and that's what he does cold calls he had no mm-hmm. problem with the nose he's like Whatever. yep yep done not personal <laughs> yeah that, not that's personal. it yeah but but for most people it just it, it, like if it's 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 exposure therapy right like you need to be exposed to rejections to become like desensitized to it you know that's and a good then, like, point yeah yeah and if you're not then it's just like this is what inhibits so many people. It's just that fear of rejection. I get it. You know, I, I had it. And in some ways I still have it, but I've become so desensitized through it throughout the years of just everything I've done 
selling online, offline, all that sort of stuff, uh, pitching ideas and books and, and whatnot. Makes um, sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question on that. And this was actually something I wanted to talk about going into this. Yeah. How do you handle online negative comments or interactions, you know, either in your Facebook forum or on YouTube or other places you may be? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, fortunately, these days, it's kind of odd. I get I get far fewer of those sorts of comments these days than I did 10, 12 years ago. I remember like 10, 12 years ago online, man, I don't know if it's the nature of the algorithm of just better sifting people to relevant uh, places or what, but I remember my YouTube channel used to be flooded with hate. <laughs> just, I mean, just <laughs> flooded with, with, with uh, hate. Um, just like constant trolls and, and stuff like that. And of course, you know, being much younger, I would, I would just act foolishly and like get into it with people. Um, but you learn things over the years again of not yeah. wanting to go back to like, you know, your early twenties and, and this or that it's, um, so what do I do now to keep a healthy and positive environment? This is something I've, I've put a good amount of thought in over the years. If I've tried to form, you know, what Dan John calls intentional community. One is expectations from the start about everything. I mean, this goes across the board for life, but you have to be setting the tone and expectations from the top. So if you go to my my Facebook group, my Strong on Facebook group, there's like a huge list of expectations. Mm -hmm. What is this group about? What do we talk about? What do we not talk about, right? You have political opinions? Great. Keep them out of here. Isn't what it's for. <laughs> oh, but politics is important. Great. Don't care. Keep out it out of here. here where you're gone, right? Yeah. Great. Um, you know, uh, like, because we are together, and helping each other in this. That's what this group is for, right? Uh, feedback is, you know, appreciated, but like your tone will be monitored, right? If you're a jerk, if you're crass, if you're crude, if you're vulgar, you're out. Like we just have policies of standard right from the beginning. Like, uh, and I, I've realized that just having those terms of agreement, if you will, right from the start, I have them everywhere. I have them when you join my email list, what you can expect from me, what I expect from you. And like being very clear, like if you violate this, Pat Flynn is a pretty ruthless dictator. I like I, I joke around that I run my stuff like a dictator, but I do. Right. If you violate these things, I'm kind of like, well, you're, you're you're just gone. Right. Uh, that's yes. it. Like I was I was clear from the start. Um, people are sometimes surprised because like, hey, I just I bought something for you and I just refund their money. I'm like, I'm gone. I don't want I don't want your business if this is yeah. how you do. Uh, and you're people worth are worth money out. Yeah. No, you're you're gone. And then. Oftentimes it like, causes people to like sincerely repent. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is good. That's what they need to do. Uh, and they need to see that, you know, childish troll-like behavior will not and should not be tolerated, right? And sometimes they just Love need a, a firm sort of guiding hand on that and a firm rejection. Honestly, like, look, your money, I say this kind of like it means nothing to me, right? If you're gonna act like this, you're you're out of you're out of the group. You're just you're not you're not my customer, right? Um, so that's that's the biggest thing for me is it, what the group is about, what our mission is, uh, the terms of behavior how you're expected to act and very clear guidelines for what will get you permanently removed. Um, and then, you know, just leading from the top, like how you speak, how you act, I find is extremely important. If you're putting out content where you are attacking people and you're tribalistic and you're denigrating mm -hmm. and you're insulting, that just attracts all that stuff right yes. back. Right. But if you're somebody who's, you know, trying to be fair, trying to be balanced, you can criticize of course, but always, you know, doing it with a, a spirit of charity and like really trying to get at the truth of things. That even if people disagree with you, this is especially true for my philosophy channel, because what do philosophers do? They disagree with people. That's all <laughs> they do. Right. So yeah. like constantly offering criticism and disagreements, but it's a spirit in which it's offered that it invites a dialogue that is very rare online, which is one where, OK, we disagree, but we're really trying to understand each other and, and move. And I love that. That's the sort of thing that that, you know, that that channel is really for. So between very clear expectations from the start. And setting that tone and the and the model from the top, those are the two biggest things uh, that I've realized. And then when nasty stuff comes in, like honestly, it doesn't it doesn't bother me like it did. It's a desensitization, right? Like when you've been sure. called names on the internet for fi longer than fifteen years, because look, man, I grew up with the internet. I've on forums yeah. for as long as I can remember. Uh, yeah, just just things just like they don't get you anymore, you know. Uh, but yeah, you either become more confident in yourself, or you just realize like it's just it's just so ridiculous and stupid it's not worth paying attention to mm -hmm. that's that's good insight uh like you uh well we do have our standards on our facebook mm -hmm. uh group for backcountry snowboarding and skiing and and then in the youtube um yeah i'm trying to think 
there's this new newer technique with YouTube where you can block a person from their comments and they don't know it. So they think they're engaging and nobody just, talk, just, just talking to the air, but they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the term is called, but it's pretty cool. That's interesting. Right. Yeah, so, so they're just, they're just, they're just, you know, huffing steam over there and nobody's feeling nobody's... validated. And, oh, <laughs> yeah, I got them good. No one. You so just, funny, just wasting yeah. your time. Mm -hmm. uh, so before I do that to them, I have a one, one chance, not three chance, a one chance. And I reply to them like, uh, we're not a good fit for each other. I'm going to go ahead and block you. Bye. I'm a one chance. I'm a one chance dude too. Yeah. Um, you know why? We're actually the same way with our children. Not that I block or ban my children, but we don't do like, we don't do strikes or warnings. Yeah. It's like, no, we've been clear with you guys. Yeah. Right. And if no, you violate good. it, like you get the punishment, that's it. Like we're not, mm -hmm. Oh no, better not do that. Because why? Because children love to push the limits. Right. And if they know, they have three warnings or strikes. How far do you think they're going? They're going to go. They're going to use them all up. Of course they will. I always did, yeah. right? So, yeah, we don't do strikes or warnings. Like, but we're very clear with our kids what is expected, why it's expected. I think we have you know very good communication. They do understand it, and that's it. You know, yeah. you 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 do the thing. You you serve the time, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Isn't that from like Heat, the movie Heat? Maybe I'm not sure. Don't, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Yeah, the famous line, right? Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. That's so true. I'm glad we're on the same page. I'm like, am I an asshole for like just one and done? But no, I, I feel better about it. I'm like, okay, it's off my conscience. And it's off yeah, there, hopefully. Because other people see that, right? And they're like, oh, this dude's serious. Yeah. We're here. I to better, help. I better yeah. like think before I open my mouth. Yeah. Right. And that helps to create a far, far better culture. Right. Totally. I'd rather have uh whatever ten thousand awesome engaged people who understand what we're doing and have each other's back over a million people just coming in. Fighting, trolling, right, one hundred percent, yeah, one hundred percent, quality over quantity mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very helpful. I did get in one argument this this week, and I've not done this before, and it was really awkward. Uh, in our backcountry ski and snowboard group, a woman moved from Germany, and she moved to Colorado, and she said, "Hey, I'm Elga from Germany. I don't have one the education yet, eager to get it. The equipment yet, eager to get it or borrow it." Um, would anybody feel safe taking me to a safe backcountry spot or in the resort? Very tricky question because the right answer is like, can you come to a certification and not know anything about it? Sure. We can teach you things, but then afterwards you can do them better. I don't want to gatekeep from that, but, um, you won't know what you know, don't know until you get there. Yeah. Right. Um, but a lot of people jump on it. You don't belong here. You need the education and the gear. I was like, She's open to doing that. She's also open to going into resort and you can have uphill access in a resort. That's something you can do safely. Um, and so she was happy with my answer. And then a person, a respected person who has books written on backcountry travel in the area called me. I said, there's no such thing as safe, Sean. I was like, what are we talking about? Semantics here? Like you're an author. You're very intelligent. Like did I misuse the word safe? And so I gave my definition of safe going off of measurable things like slope angle, uh, the forecast from the avalanche forecast, time, weather, going to the places. Mm -hmm. When summertime, so I know the terrain, what to expect. He's like, yeah, that's all. Those are all feelings. And I was like, those were all actual things, though. And so he starts to escalate it. And I'm like, I think like, they they seem objectively measurable. I don't know much about that, but they seem. Yeah, yeah. I could tell you uh, what the angle of the slope is and how much snow is on. These are like really measurable, right? Right. And that's I'm... independent about how I feel about it. I <laughs> yeah. like it. Yeah, I, uh... I, think I like it. I go do it. So uh, this goes on for 24 hours. And I kindly talked him down. He's also a very big, you know, person in his community. Yeah. And finally, I was like. I'm going to end this debate until we meet in person and talk about it. And then I, I was really heated and I had a few drinks. I direct messaged him. And I said, Hey, you've wasted 24 of my hours of this soul sucking. Um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Splitting of hairs. Yes. Uh, either get with the program or get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Good. For, yeah. Good for you, man. Yeah. I, uh, fortunately I haven't had an issue like that in a long time. I used to have them all the time. All the time. I, bet. I think I think I'm so much better about it now because I'm like on the other side of things. Like I was that guy who was always fighting with people on the internet, yeah. man, for so many years. And like now I'm just so over it. I'm so over it. And um, what I found is like if something starts to get like that and it's a person that um, I know and like I can see like, OK, this might start to strain a relationship like it just like online is the worst place. Yeah. For it. Like get on the phone. Um, or see each other in person because like when you just change the format 
it's so different, right? Mm -hmm. It's just so different than when you're just like, you know, on a Facebook thread, right? Uh, yeah. Where so where so much could be missed or misinterpreted, and it's so easy to just to say things that you wouldn't normally say to somebody's face. So my policy now is like, yeah, fortunately I haven't had to deal with this in a long time, but it's like, look, if we if we want to disagree. And I really, you know, don't want this to like sour the relationship, especially if it's on something important. Like we're just going to we're going to at least get on the phone. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, preferably even just, you know, meet up in person or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's a really good angle to approach it from, because I probably will see this person on the skin track or in the backcountry and um, no hate. Just don't like the way he talks. Yeah. Like, and other times it's just like, yeah, that's just that's just that's just it. And mm -hmm. it's just got to move on. Right. Totally. Oh, good stuff. Um, oh, so you are upgrading your process of video and audio production. What what's this all about? What do you want to accomplish? Yeah, that? trying to, man. So I've I, I I like I like exciting goals. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I guess it would be good for me to state it now because it's all about sort of skin in the game. So like, yeah, last year I had the goal of the books and the articles and um and and I've had business goals for many years and you know, very thankfully done well with it like you know direct response email marketing that's that's what i do right uh wife's home we we homeschool the five kids but the one thing i've never really uh cracked the code of because i've never really even tried is social media right for 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 better or worse like social media has just sort of um in some senses kind of just automatically taken off for me but then things change and then like i just don't care anymore and this or that so um and my wife my wife, God love her. She's so patient with me, Sean. She's so patient. And uh, so much of what I do is just not financially relevant. In fact, it's probably a financial drain. Like what is what is writing academic philosophy papers for somebody who's not in academia? Like what what does this do aside from nothing? I just like to do it. And she's always supported it. So I'm like, you know, what, Christine, I want to set a goal this year that might actually have a positive financial benefit instead of just taking all of our time and money and just flushing it down the toilet, right? And so like I I want I want to crack the YouTube code. I want to do it. Right. I want to start two new channels with quality production. I've been doing a lot of research. We can talk about it. you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. Uh, uh one is fitness related, one's going to be related to my uh, little green book about uh, uh productivity and 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 skill acquisition and skill stacking and becoming a generalist and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And between those two channels, I want to get that stupid what is it, what is it that YouTube does? The goal is that 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 plaque, didn't they say like a silver oh, yeah, plaque yeah, or plaque. something? Yeah, I think yeah. I that's the that's the target. Day. That's the target. Yeah, okay. um, that's the target. Within, I I think two years, I think would be like a good like right. aggressive, but um, I think doable. I mean, look, I I have a friend, a good friend, man, and like it goes to show, like if you can crack the code, you can do. Because he was running a channel, uh, philosophy related, kind of like my philosophy channel, which has grown. It's got you know a number of thousand subscribers, but slowly, um, but without attention to what the algorithm cares about then he started a new channel where he specifically did pay attention to what the algorithm started about maybe six or seven months ago already has seventy five thousand subscribers constant viral videos so that is like that was really inspiring to me and i'm like um yeah that's 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 what i want to do this year and so that that relates to the production thing because one of the things that i've realized is if you want to make youtube happy you got to care about how things look, how things are edited, how things are essentially all the stuff I've never been doing. I've always been an impromptu, crappy camera, throw it up there, not great mic. Um, and like people who like my content, uh, you know, who do my kind of say it's amazing content. But the thing is, my content doesn't get, I don't think it gets really promoted or featured because I'm not hitting or checking certain boxes mm -hmm. that YouTube cares about. So my goal this year now is to, is to get those boxes checked and to take it a lot more seriously. I don't know if I'll hit it, but I know I'm going to try really hard. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. I would love to know what he did for channel two to grow that dramatically. Oh, well, dude, I'll, I'll give you a channel. I'll give him a plug. His name is, uh, he's, he's, um, I was on his other, uh, he was on my podcast too. Uh, his name is Parker set a case, uh, and his channel, his new channel, um, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. And it also helps cause he's got this really cool handlebar mustache. His new channel is called park notes, park notes, like spark notes, but park notes. And, um, he's, uh, he's, uh, his original channel was like, you know, like my philosophy channel, like deeper dive, uh, philosophy stuff. And it's a pretty niche type of thing. I get that. And his new one is just, it's, it's what a lot of channels do and they get a lot of attention. It's like, you know, helping people to learn and study better, like much more kind of 
it's not like super deep technical philosophy. It's much more just practical how to, you know, here's how to get more out of your reading and study sessions with commonplace books or journaling, like really kind of basic stuff, but he does a really good job with it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then he just focused on again, much higher quality production, you know, uh, the appropriate length, good editing, good scripting, you know, good thumbnails, good headlines, all the stuff just, and clearly he did it right. Because if you're looking at his channel right now, I, I think you yeah. are like, it's, it's impressive, man. Like this boom. The chapters, chapters and, he, mm -hmm. and the chapters. So, uh, I've been studying a lot of channels like that, but like seeing his, uh, a friend of mine, like, like him have that sort of recent success was like, all right, yeah, I do want to. I do want to try and finally like I've been on YouTube for like 15 years, but I never cared to try and do it right, which it's kind of irresponsible, I guess. No, right? But it speaks testimony to what you want to do. You want you want to give your quality, your help and be useful to your audience. Yeah. And you're really good at that. You're the best at that. Well, thank you. And it's not like my, my channels have been like, I got a good number of subscribers. and I have a few views that are like, I don't know, I have one. But of course, it's all my stupid videos that are like like. Almost like I have one video. It's almost close to a million views or something. And it's just so dumb. It's like, why did that one take off? Like, I, I want to delete it. And I have like one goblet squat video that like did really well, but I'm like super young and it's not that great. It's like, man, that one has to have all these hundreds of thousands of views. And why? I mean, it's good. Why? I, I why? feel like I will put in, what I think is great production. I'll drive to the mountains. I'll get lights out. I'll have two or three cameras like I do right now set up, got the mics on. And I'm in, in the environment of which the thing should be used. I got all the facts and it gets like a thousand views. I'm like, cool. And then I, I put a hoodie on, a crappy one, and it got 350,000 views. I'm like, what? Dude, what? yeah, I know. So, you know, there's things that you can analyze and that's what I've been doing and things that I think, think help your chances. But at the end of the day, I don't, there's obviously no guarantees, mm -hmm. but this is good, man. You just, you just, you just, you know, you just committed me. I, I this is something I shared with my wife, but I haven't made, uh, a public commitment yet so here i am all right people can people can look you know a year or two from now and see if i did it or not and maybe i will look i set a lot of goals uh i do not accomplish them all uh but i do work very hard at all of them and this is one that that has yeah i think it's been a long time coming because just like everything i do online is just and i've ignored social media for far too long i'm just like right, i'm i'm gonna do try at least try to do it right mm -hmm. i love it well how can i start helping you you have camera, you got microphones. Do you have lighting? Do you have uh, a, a space? Yeah, man. Um, you want to you wanna talk about that now? Is there anything else you want to do for your audience before I bore I'm, you I'm, with all those questions? No, yeah. no. I, this excites me. I've helped set up a few different uh, of our writers' YouTube stations. Like I've given them cameras with microphones, whether it's wireless or whether it's uh, on top of the – I don't have them here, of course – on top of the camera microphone, which might be good for you. Yeah. Because you're in kind of a static room. You're not dealing with a lot of noise. Maybe the HVAC kicks on here or there, but you're probably fairly well insulated in there. Yeah. Well, um, how about this? How about if there's anything else you want to chat for your audience, be happy to do it. Otherwise, I will just give you a tour of my equipment in my house and you yeah. can tell me, you let's can tell it. me everything that you think, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. I got a notebook right here. Let's see what we can fix. <laughs> cool. Cool. Cool, man. All right. Um, all right. Let me, um, yeah, let's, let's do this. Can we, can we wrap the podcast up? Of course. Yeah. And then we'll, and then we will uh, go do that. Perfect. Uh, Pat Flynn going to check out how to be better at almost everything. And that's going to be turning in. And Hey, tell your audience if they're interested in like this setup thing. And after we do this, we want to do another thing. Maybe we could do another episode on it. Oh but, yeah. Before yeah. and after. And I'll yeah. do before and after too, because mine's going to change in the next month or so too. It's yeah. always evolving. So this will be fun. Yeah. We'll, we'll each level up. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, thank you for, for plugging my book. If people want to link up with me, you can find me on, on, I'll be starting new YouTube channels, but my current ones are, uh, if you just Google Pat Flynn kettlebells, you'll find my kettlebell YouTube channel. If you're into the philosophy stuff, you just Google Pat Flynn philosophy, it'll pop right up. You can link up there. Perfect, Pat. We will come back with a part two of the super studio, uh, an upcoming engagement podcast. Thanks for having the pleasure of breaking it here first and <laughs> allow me to be part of this. Uh, as always, Pat, one of my favorite people to hang out with, uh, to chat with, to learn from, uh, to to find on social media. I'm always showing you off to all my my clients and students and friends because you're so fascinating. My oh, dude, seriously, making me blush. Yep. <laughs> yeah, my mother-in-law loves you because she's a recovering Catholic and she just thinks the way you approach um, all of this is just amazing. Well, yeah. Well, God love her and uh, please tell her that I I said hello and I'll pr be praying for. Her.
Fantastic. I'll see you tonight. All right, team. Sean Sewell with the Human Cut.com podcast. Stay tuned for the next one. See you guys.